Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a new series that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and now I really think it's kind of time to do it. It's a series devoted to batches of 10 recordings of non-standard repertoire that I think belong in every serious classical music collection, just because it's wonderful. You might call it kind of an, an expanded version of Dave's faves, but here, in this particular case, we're doing it by label because I really want to spend some time paying tribute to all those fabulous independent labels that have been spending the past several decades recording unusual or specific or proprietary repertoire, often with no budget or money to promote it. Some of them, they don't even really know what they have. God knows they don't know how to sell it. And most of it stays in print because independent labels are not so delete happy as the majors are. I mean, not all of it, but most of it is around. Uh, you can find it or download it pretty easily because they keep better websites where they have most of their stuff available in some form or another. I just think that we need to pay tribute to these labels that have done so much to increase our enjoyment and expand our horizons. And for those of you who are still in the early classical phases and, you know, stuck on the Mozart, you know, Beethoven, Brahms, you know, that sort of stuff. Give this some thought because I, I promise you it's all wonderful, wonderful music. And there'll be a list of composers and works um, below each video so that you can see what I'm talking about. And now that so many people have access to streaming services. It's very, very easy to sample this stuff. I mean, I don't have to play extracts and whatnot. You can find it easily. You can have an opportunity to listen to it. And I want to get these names out there because if we don't talk about them and if we don't talk about them regularly, then they'll never have a chance of getting the, the acclaim that they deserve. And they really do deserve it. There's no question about it because the music is magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. So let me just start by saying today we are talking about Chandos, which has done, I mean, you know, they, they're called independent labels. Chandos is a major label. It has an enormous catalog. It has done incredible series of stuff. And, and the, the breadth of that catalog is, 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 is incredible. It's like soul shatteringly fabulous, but you can't even wrap your brains around it. I don't even know if they've wrapped their brains around it. Certainly they could do with a major repackage reissue program. They really need that because they have so much great stuff and some of it's available and some of it isn't regularly, but I'm going to go through just 10 wonderful recordings. They're not necessarily my favorites. They're not necessarily the greatest ever. They're just Terrific. I mean, it, it's not like the, we need to pick it and say, well, that just that one or we, we, none of that. They're just worth owning and worth hearing music that's worth listening to. And we're going to go through all of these independent labels, lots and lots of them to try and give you a sense of what's out there. What's been done? It's so hard to see it from our perspective now with the, the market and total chaos and craziness. So maybe this will help. Maybe this will help them a little bit. And I certainly hope it will help you to, to start to make some playlists of your own of things that you might want to sample and listen to. So here we go. You ready? The first one is, it's, not, it, it, it's all non-standard repertoire, but not necessarily people you've never heard of. I'm not deliberately courting obscurity here. Just wonderful performances, well-packaged and produced that you can listen to. Because here's a typical example. This is all of the Vaughn Williams concertos. It's on two discs, and it just was such a handy thing to have. Really a wonderful thing to have. Because, you know, I mean, it's almost all, yes, they're all here. You know, you know, Vaughn Williams concertos originally came packaged with individual symphonies. But then the symphonies got boxed up, and the concertos got stripped out, and... You know, the concertos aren't as popular as the symphonies. They're not as well known, but they're exquisitely beautiful as often as not and well worth hearing. And so here are a pile of them on two wonderful discs. You get the Concerto Grosso for String Orchestra, the Oboe Concerto, 
the Concerto for Violin and Strings, also known as Concerto Academico, the Tuba Concerto, two hymn tune preludes, you get the Lark Ascending, which is almost a movement from a violin concerto, you get the Piano Concerto in C major with Howard Shelley, it's a great performance, and it's a fabulous work, wonderful, wonderful work, and the Partita for Double String Orchestra, and also Toward the Unknown Region for Chorus and Orchestra for reasons that they had it, they stuck it in there, and isn't that nice? Now, the performances are all with the London Symphony Orchestra and Chorus under Bryden Thompson. It was a beautiful series. They weren't all great. Not all the symphonies were fabulous. You know, not everything is equally wonderful. But this is a really great way to top off your Vaughn Williams collection. So, Vaughn Williams Concerti, definitely worth considering on Chandos. Next! I was just listening to this the other day, and I had such a good time. This is such a wonderful disc. This is Bach, um, The Transcriptions of Concerti by Vivaldi, played by Sophie Yates, harpsichordist, which is just lovely. You know, you know, Bach did a lot of Vivaldi concerto transcriptions. He arranged full violin concerti for a single harpsichord. Um, and very literally, he didn't mess with them very much. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them on here. Eight individual concerti lasting 76 minutes. It's a very well filled CD. And it's a very convenient way to get this repertoire. You know, most of the time you, you'll get this, but it's in like one of those enormous Bach editions or stuffed with other things. To have a single disc with, you know, all of Bach's. Vivaldi keyboard transcriptions, or most of them, in any case, the solo keyboard transcri transcriptions is extremely handy. And it's a wonderful aspect of Bach's art, which is quite little known. And it, so, uh, you know, if you're a harpsichord and a Bach person and a Vivaldi person, you're going to like this. So again, it's Sophie Yates doing the Bach Vivaldi transcriptions for solo harpsichord. <sighs> yeah, I got that out on Chandos. Next, oh, this is another chamber music disc. Oh my goodness, I love this disc. One of you actually mentioned it, and and I, I am so happy to be able to talk about it here. It's Bax Chamber Music from the planet Baxia. Came this series, this release. This was funded by the Planet Baxia Council for the Chamber Music Arts. And you get his octet, his string quintet, the Concerto for Flute, Oboe, Harp, and String Quartet, which is a septet, actually, and it's gorgeous. Ah, gorgeous. And the Threnody and Scherzo, um, you know, for, for bassoon, harp, and string sextet. I mean, it better be. And In Memoriam for English Horn, Harp, and String Quartet. These are lovely works, and even the large works are not of of excessive length, which is a good thing. Let me tell you, the string quintet is 11 minutes in one movement. The octet is is in, let's see, it's like 16 and a bit minutes. It's for horn, piano, and string uh, something or other, whatever it takes to more string sextet. There we go. And the concerto for flute, the septet thing is 19 minutes. I mean, we're not talking about crazy length, but we are talking about gorgeous textures, some unbelievably beautiful melodies, and you know, and music that you've never heard before by a composer who's known for his big, splashy orchestral music, but who was just as sensitive in writing for smaller forces. So the artists here are the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields Chamber Ensemble with Margaret Fingerhut, piano. Take a listen to this if you can. You will really enjoy it. There's just, a, it's a world of, of music that is awaiting discovery. And again, you know, good luck ever hearing any of this stuff live and in concert. So it's Bax, chamber music. That's number three. Number four. Oh, this is a wonderful disc. This is Court Vial Symphonies 1 and 2 and the Quodlebet, which is just a really cool big orchestral work that no one ever does. It's, it's like, what is it, 22 minutes long. Um, in the multiple movements. It's the musical entertainment. It comes from his Zaubernacht, um, and he arranged it. It's really a suite from the, the, the opera play musical thing. Now, the first symphony is quite gnarly, um, and as, you, as some of you may know, it's in this sort of angular, chromatic, you know, pre-Honegger sort of idiom. 
The second symphony dates from exactly the same time as the Seven Deadly Sins in Paris. And this recording is important. And the reason it's important, first of all, it's with the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie Bremen, which is just an amazing ensemble, under Anthony Beaumont, who's a, a vile specialist, really a Zemlinsky scholar more than anything else, but he's very good at music of this period for the most part. And the Second Symphony had an interesting history because it was written in France um, as, you know, you know Vial was you know, forced out of Germany when the Nazis came to power. And, and it, Bruno Walter conducted the premiere and suggested to him that he add some percussion because originally it was just for a small orchestra and timpani. And he did. And the percussion parts are wonderful. They are really idiomatic and they make a lot of sense. But all of the other performances of the symphony take them out. And the critical edition, the quasi-critical edition published by Schott, Schott takes them out. And that's a mistake. That's wrong. Not because I'm a percussionist, but because there was no reason for Weil to add them unless he felt that he wanted them there. And the fact that they were suggested by Bruno Walter is absolutely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant to the question of the authenticity of the actual percussion parts. I mean, in my view, no other performance of the symphony, and it is a masterpiece, a wonderful symphony, is, is complete without the forces being used that Weil actually wrote for at the premiere. So, I mean, that's how I feel about it. And this performance has them, and it's the only one, and it's just great. So, Court Vial, Symphony Number no. 2, and, and, and the Quodlibet, and, and this other stuff, and Symphony Number no. 1 with Anthony Beaumont and the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie Bremen. Oh, my goodness, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So, that's one of those things you may not even know is on Chandos. You see? I mean, it's not just all, like, weird English stuff. It's weird everything stuff. It's a huge range of stuff. Next, oh, this is a classic. Martineau Chamber Orchestra Works. These are so delightful. Now, one of them, the Sinfonietta La Jolla, which was written for the town of La Jolla, California, is, is quite well known. And it's, it's, it's really a lovely, lovely little work. It's for piano and chamber ensemble. But these other two works are not well known at all. First, there's the Sinfonietta Giacosa, which is a four movement, 30 minute long piece for tiny little orchestra. It's for strings, a few woodwinds and piano. And it's delicious. It's a wonderful, wonderful work that never gets played. It's, just, ugh, it's really a piano concerto and a great one. Absolutely phenomenal, neoclassical delight. And the second work is even more rare and more gorgeous and mysterious. It's called, it's just called Toccata e Due Canzone, Toccata and Two Songs. It was a late work written after Martin who had suffered a fall and bashed his head and he was recovering and he wrote this piece. Um, it is very, very spooky but incredibly haunting. The opening toccata is one of the most beautiful movements that anybody ever wrote in the 20th century. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal piece. And the two canzones are, are strange. The piece becomes more dissonant and angular as it goes, which probably accounts for its lack of popularity. But it's, again, it's a major work, 25 minutes long. And these are wonderful performances. This is with the Bournemouth Sin Sinfonietta. Julian Jacobson is the pianist. And Thomas Vasari, remember him? Thomas Vasari is the conductor. Just a great, great disc of little-known music by a great, great 20th century composer, Martin. I mean, I know some of you people out there know these works, and you know how great they are. So tell your friends and listen to this stuff. Listen especially to that Toccata e Due Canzone and the Sinfonietta Giacosa, which is... With the flute. Oh, it's just amazing. It's so much fun. Anyway, you're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. Back to England. Here's another, another disc that I absolutely, or a pair of discs that I think is wonderful and such a terrific addition to the catalog. Stanford. Now, you know, Stanford doesn't get a lot of play. 
and because he's sort of a so-so composer, um, his symphonies have their passionate admirers. I am not one of them, but he was a very, very good, solid composer. He was, and the symphonies are attractive. It's just that, you know, there's lots of attractive symphonies, but this two disc set, it's like what they did with Vaughn Williams. This is all of his non-symphonic shorter works that were originally coupled to the symphonies and other things, the longer things, and they're better by and large. They're really memorable and fun to listen to. You've got the three Irish rap, four Irish rhapsodies, pardon me. There are four, five, what am I saying? Six, holy crap, yeah, see? There are six Irish rhapsodies. They're like the list Hungarian rhapsodies, the Dvorak Slavonic rhapsodies. Nothing not to love. They don't, they don't, you know, incite all of his anal retentivity like the symphonies do. You know, you write symphonies, you can't use percussion, you can't use a harp, you can't do this, you can't do that. The problem with the English symphonic tradition before Elgar is that it was defined almost entirely negatively. It's like if Mendelssohn or Spohr didn't do it, you couldn't do it. And I mean, Spohr even had like percussion and things in some of his symphonies, but this, this, these composers were, were just a concatenation of musical inhibitions and, and taking the most conservative and stuffy German tradition as their models. And Stanford was one of those. He tried to push it as much as he could while remaining within the model. But in these pieces, in these freeform pieces, these, these pieces based on Irish folk tunes and based on you know, nationalistic melodies and orchestral color, and he, he could do it every damn well pleased. And when he was in that mode, he was a much better composer. Not surprisingly. So this is another disc. It, it features the Ulster Orchestra uh, under Vernon, Vernon Handley. And you've got, like I said, you've got all these Irish rhapsodies, some of which have solo solo parts. You know, one is for, as a solo cello, one as a solo violin. You also get the clarinet concerto, which is lovely, 19 minutes of lovely clarinet writing, and his concert piece for organ and orchestra with Gillian Ware, and the Oedipus Rex Prelude. What's not to love? This is, for me, the Stanford disc to get if you are having only one, to really introduce you to, you know, the best of what this composer could do. And here it all is, two perfectly lovely discs. On Chandos, once again. Oh, I love this one too. Okay, I've done a talk on this. I've done talks on some of these already, by the way. And I will do others, the things in here, eventually I may do talks on those singly as well. Because like I said, if we don't talk about them, if we don't play them, if we don't listen to them, if we don't encourage people, they'll just disappear. I mean, it's nice that I could do a video on some of this stuff, but I had done, a, you know, more than at this point, almost 1200 videos. And, you, you, you know, one of them, it's not enough to sell the product. You understand what I mean? So I do feel justified in, in mentioning some of these things more than once because they got to sink in. It's the only way, the only way to do it is repetition by pushing, pushing and repeating and saying over and over again, you got to hear this and you got to hear Torino's Canto a Sevilla. This is the, the Spanish Das Lied von der Erde, <laughs> if you want to call it that. It's, it's for soprano and orchestra or mezzo-soprano, actually, and it's in seven movements. There are four vocal movements and three instrumental movements. And I, I did, I talked about this already, but the problem with the piece is that you can't get a score. It's impossible. You get two scores because the orchestral movements were separated from the vocal movements, and then you have to put them back together. It's insane what a mess this thing is in terms of publishing and getting the parts to do it. It's only been recorded a, four or five times. And this is, aside from Victoria de los Angeles, who did it in mono for Warner, this is clearly the best. It's the best, it's, it's probably the best of all of them. It's gorgeous, sonically, fabulously played by Juan Jomena and the BBC Philharmonic with Maria Espada, soprano. And you also get his Rhapsodia Sinfonica and the Danzas Gitanas and the, and the La Procesión del Rocío, all of which are gorgeous, 
gorgeous works. I mean, Torita's music is just so beautiful. It's like painful. <laughs> it's not even funny. But the great work is Canto a Savi. It's 37 minutes. Why it never gets performed, I have no idea. It would bring the house down in concert. It really would. And so here I'm telling you once again, if you do not have Torino's, Torino's, Torino, that's a car, the Grand Torino, right? Torina's Canto a Sevilla, you must get this. You just have to have it. It's just that great. So there's that one. We have three more to go. That's seven, eight. Ah, more English music. Moran, the symphony in G minor. E.J. Moran was a wonderful drunk, a fabulous composer. He was found floating dead in a river, died of a heart attack, probably brought on by acute alcohol poisoning or something. He was, he was a mess. He was a mess. Ernest was his name, E.J. Ernest Moran. And uh, his dates were 1894 to 1950. He was working on another symphony when he, you know, went overboard and whatever. But this contains the Rhapsody for Piano and Orchestra with the redoubtable Margaret Fingerhut and the Symphony under Vernon Handley with the Ulster Orchestra, a great performance. The other great one was, was Adrian Bolt on Lyrita, which is tremendous as well. But this was one of the early, glorious early Chandos recordings, and it's just a fabulous, fabulous work. It sounds a lot like Sibelius's Tapiola played sideways, as I've pointed out on numerous occasions, heavily influenced by Sibelius, but all to the good, and this sort of folksy Vaughn Williamsy stuff, but the finale is just pure tapiola all the way. It's tapiola with a tam-tam, actually, at one point. A fantastic work that you really ought to know. And his, his output is, again, it's rather slender. It all fits on, like, you know, three or four discs. And so if you like this, you can get all the rest of it because it all sounds like that. You know, it's, it's all quite similar, but it's wonderful. It's simply wonderful. He was a minor master, but none the worse for that. And this symphony is his masterpiece and a great work. It certainly is. It's right up there with like, you know, Walton One and the Vaughan Williams Four and those, those English interwar works. And gosh, that was a great, great school of composition that produced some amazing music. So, Moran, yes, you want that. You want it, I know. Next, what's this one? Oh, you know, Chandos did a whole series with Matthias Bammert of the music of Frank Martin, Swiss composer. Remember him? It's like five or six discs in this series, and no one pays any attention to it. And Martin is a terrific composer. Really challenging but worthwhile composer. And this particular disc... Um, I, did they have volume numbers for this? Well, no, I don't see it. They don't. They don't. But it has. He wrote a symphony, which this, this is its premier recording. No one ever cared. It's it's a somewhat elusive and difficult work, but a very very interesting one. But his most famous work is the Petite Symphony Concertant for double string orchestra, harp, harpsichord, and piano, which is the the work the way the work is usually recorded. It's terribly difficult to balance. The best recording of it is still the old Leopold Stokowski one on, on Warner that's in the Leopold Stokowski Warner icon box. It's amazing. It's still the best. But he made a version of it for full symphony orchestra because getting a harp, harpsichord, and piano together was getting turning out to be difficult. It was easier to just use a regular orchestra. Now, I prefer the original version, but it's still a wonderful work. And hearing it in this version is a lot of fun. And on this disc, you get, so you get his rarely heard actual symphony. He only wrote one officially. The Symphony Concertante in its full orchestral version and his Passacaglia for large orchestra, which is also a magnificent work. Absolutely magnificent. And then there's five more discs of this guy, if you like what you hear. I mean, what's, you know, and it's on Chandos and... How are they going to promote it? What, what are they going to do to get people to listen to it? What can we do except talk about it and tell you it's there? So Frank Martin, give it some thought. His symphony and symphony concertante. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Finally, we're staying in the sort of Germanic symphonic plane. Last but not least, Hindemith. The symphony in E-flat. 
one of the all-time great 20th century symphonies. Hindemith's abstract symphonies get no play. The ones that are attached to operas, like Mattis der Mahler or even the Harmonia der Welt, those get played because they are somewhat programmatic and that gives you something to hang your hat on. But the symphony in E-flat is one of the all-time great symphonies of the 20th century. And there are only a couple really wonderful performances of it. There's Leonard Bernstein, and there's this one with Jan Pascal Tortelier and the BBC Philharmonic. It also comes with Nobilissima Visione, which is quite popular, people know, and the Neues von Taga Overture, which many people do not know. That was one of his Weimar Republic operas that scandalized the emerging Nazi party and caused him no end of trouble with the authorities. But this symphony is a masterpiece, period. And everybody ought to hear it. Unfortunately, most of the German performances are these sort of clogged up farty things that you, you just aren't going to want to hear. They're, they're, so, they're so congested and clunky sounding because Hindemith can sound that way if you play it that way. But Bernstein is electrifying, of course and uh, a law unto himself. And this is a really first-class performance by Tortelier. It's not too thick. It's not rhythmically stodgy. It's exciting. It's wonderfully well-recorded. It's extremely well-played. And the work will just, you will be dazzled by this piece. You really will. And it has a root part. You know what a root is? Mahler uses a root. It's, it's a bundle of twigs you hit the bass drum case with. It begins the scherzo. Do 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 click 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 like that. But it's you don't even need to care about the root. It's okay. Just love the symphony. It's also in cyclical form. It's wonderful to listen to it over and over again to hear the thematic interrelationships, and it's very moving. The second movement is a a glorious funeral march, very elegiac written for, you know, mostly the brass section and, and very passionate for intimate, full of intense expression. And it's, it's just great. It's great. Listen to the symphony flat and Chandos has the best recording of it after Bernstein. So those, my friends, are 10 non-standard works that ought to be in the repertoire, but that aren't, but that you can hear on a fabulous independent label that has, which has lavished untold amounts of time and money and effort and resources in making first-class recordings available to us. And we have a, an obligation to pay attention to them, to listen to them, to try and find something new, something we haven't heard of before, something that will really speak to us. And I guarantee to every single person who's watching this, there is something in this pile and the list of works, which is below here, that will do that for you. Guaranteed. It's just, it's just a question of taking some time and having a little bit of the spirit of adventure. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're looking forward to the next release in this wonderful new series of 10 fabulous non-standard works by independent labels or whatever we're going to call it. I don't know. I'll figure it out between now and the time I post it. Take care.